Welcome everyone to episode 53 of the Average Ontario Anglers Fishing Podcast. The podcast that not only is clean, but we're going to have some co- super cool tips that will help you clean up out on the lake. But before we get started, actually, oh, I was going to say, we have a super cool guest. We have Dan from Great Lakes Finesse. How could I forget that? But before we get into some super cool tips from Dan, we have Andrew's interesting fishing fact of the week. Dazzle <laughs> I'll do Andrew. my best. So I'm going to start off with a multiple choice question for you. You're eating fries in a parking lot and then a black and white thing just swoops out of nowhere and steals all your French fries. What is it? Is it A, a rat bird, B, underdog, C, Jesse on a zip line, or D, a seagull? I'm going to guess that it's a seagull because that has happened to me before, <laughs> so sure. You're wrong because seagull, <laughs> you're te- I'll say technically wrong. Uh, seagull is actually a nickname. So the species are actually gulls. Seagull is just a colloquial name that's given to them. But worldwide, I didn't realize there are 54 different species of gulls worldwide. And there are 21 documented different species that have been found in Ontario of different species of gulls. Now, the one that I'm sure you're thinking of that we've all had interactions with if you've been kind of you know in Ontario or that area of like the central states and stuff like that, it's actually the ring-billed gull. And you can tell because it has a black ring on the very tip of its orange beak. Now, it's, again, most common one that we see around in Ontario. Uh, Just for the size of it, it's about 17 inches long, and it weighs about uh, one pound and eight ounces is the weight of these things. Now, that's what we think of. Now, if anyone has been to the East Coast, you know, in, in the States going up anywhere along the Atlantic, pretty much, the most common gull they have out there is actually the great black backed gull, which on rare occasions can be found in Ontario, but the size difference on that is it's 31 inches long. It has a wingspan of five feet and seven inches, and it weighs five pounds, one ounce. To put that in perspective, the red-tailed hawk is only 26 inches long, has a four foot, eight inch wingspan, not five foot seven, and it only weighs three pounds, eight ounces, not five pounds, one ounce. So <laughs> I hate to get pooped on <laughs> Those by one things of these. are huge. But it was even, we have in Ontario, it's called the little gull. It's only 11 inches long. This thing is is small. But some interesting facts about the seagull, because we always look at them as kind of just pests, right? And I'm sure we've, you know, we all see them pecking at the garbage in, in the Home Depot parking lot and whatnot. But did you know that Queen Elizabeth II was enamored with these birds so much so that she named them a protected species? So it's actually illegal to kill these birds, along with many other animals. but Seagulls are in there of a protected species. <laughs> and you think, I, I know, you're like, well, I see these guys everywhere. Ever been to Ontario Place back in the day? <laughs> but it's interesting because some people have absolutely like horrifying stories of interactions with seagulls. In fact, in Devon, this is in the, in the States, a seagull snatched a chihuahua named Gizmo and flew away with it. <laughs> and in 2015 in Cornwall, a Yorkshire Terrier had to be put down after gulls attacked him, leaving him with head wounds. And there have even been cases of people being trapped inside their home because seagulls decided to have a nest above their porch and then would not let them leave the house. The seagulls, they, they can be pretty territorial, especially during mating season. So starting in the spring, they start to establish their territories into June is when they start having their nests and stuff like that. They're young. So if you live near shorelines where they tend to uh, have their nest. They try to have cliff sides, but I know we don't have that many cliffs around. Uh, just be careful. So if you're fishing your boat, they'll start dive bombing you. And when they actually attack, they always attack from behind. So just in case that you get any smart ideas of, oh, I'm going to start harassing these guys. I'm going to chuck rocks at them. To harass wildlife, which also includes feeding wildlife, it's a $500 fine. And if you get really upset and you end up trying to kill one, it's a $500 to $1,000 fine for killing a seagull and up to six months or more in jail. So even if they're being annoying, even if they're going after your lure like I've had, <laughs> I'm I'll tell you this much, I'm glad I was able to do a successful release and it was unarmed because I did not want to get a thousand dollar fine. <laughs> but that's, uh, those are some interesting facts about seagulls. And again, had uh, we have you know, Dan from Great Lakes Finesse. And when you think of the Great Lakes, you think seagulls. <laughs> <laughs> that was interesting. That's- Thanks, Andrew. You know, one thing I do think of when we think of Great Lakes Finesse is super cool baits, right? As mentioned, if this is your first time listening to this podcast, this is a fishing podcast with average anglers telling you average advice, but I have some sad confession to tell you right now. Today, our guest is 
he's above average. So unfortunately, you may not be able to completely relate with this guy. But the cool thing is when we interview people that are super awesome at what they do, is sometimes they'll leave us some tips that will help us improve and help us become better than average anglers. So we are super excited to have Dan from Great Lakes Finesse on the podcast. How's it going, Dan? Uh, I'm doing great. Thanks, guys. i um, really pumped to finally be on this show. I, uh, I'm actually a fan, so uh, you guys are doing great. Uh, great work. Love it. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks. So today we're going to cover a little bit about some of Dan's new baits that he has coming out, and they're already on the shelves at the stores, a lot of them. And we're going to kind of cover some finesse tips for the average angler like us so that we can improve on this coming season's bass season. So first, just tell us a little bit about yourself, Dan. I know a lot of people, like even me a few years ago, I had no idea who you were. (laughs) So tell us for the average angler, who are you? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't expect anyone who's not like super hardcore to know who I am. So um, I take no offense to that at all. Let's be real. You know, as tournament anglers, we know each other and then our friends and family sometimes show up at weigh-ins. Besides that, it's uh, pretty hard to get noticed. But for me, I'm just a guy who just loves to fish. I love fishing tournaments. It's it's my favorite thing to do. I grew up playing sports and uh, my wife calls me extremely competitive, almost upset like too 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 competitive um and i'm able to channel that on the water and and compete locally here in the uh you know southern ontario and then and do some tournaments in the u.s as well um, when the opportunities there so yeah everything i do is is really so i can can compete in tournaments that's yeah. what i love and and i was looking up some information uh, i i saw the release the press release on wired to fish i think and it was saying that you had an absolutely giant bag of smallmouth that you caught in the St. Lawrence. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, uh, my fr- uh, my good friend and tournament partner, Matt Dobson, people probably don't know who he is, but uh, he, he is an absolute weapon on the water when it comes to, to fishing. And, and him and I uh, last year fished a tournament on the St. Lawrence. It was river only, and, and we just had one of those, I wouldn't call it a magical day, but it, it all came together for us nicely. It started off really bad losing the biggest fish of the day and broke our net. And then we regrouped and, and managed to put 32 and a half pounds in the boat for five fish. So uh, about six and a half pound average, if people are wanting to do the math, so a special day. And, and one I, we won't forget, uh, even broke my personal best seven pound, one ounce smallmouth in that tournament. So a uh, pretty, pretty awesome day. And, and I don't know how long that record will hold. They're getting bigger out there, but we'll take it for now. That's crazy. That's like, five fish that are the best fish that I've ever caught in my life. You caught in like four hours. And and for those very astute listeners, (laughs) that bag is equivalent to about over 21 seagulls. (laughs) (laughs) That's That's hilarious. So I know a lot of people, they don't, they don't really like, you know, tooting their own horn, but I'll toot it for you. Dan is an absolute hammer on the water. If you couldn't tell the guy is a beast and you're saying how you're competitive how you channel that energy into your fishing. And we're going to kind of talk about some of your your new baits. And obviously your brand is called Great Lakes Finesse. And a lot of the baits are finesse baits, obviously. You're not, you know, I was, I was looking at this big uh, swim bait. I was like, let's talk to Dan about, you know, fishing eight inch glide baits <laughs> today. But it's, it's kind of the opposite. It's all about finesse, right? So we're going to talk yeah. about some of your new baits. And then we're going to kind of tie it into how us as the average angler, if you're listening to this and you want to target, you know, all kinds of species of fish, but we're going to kind of talk about smallmouth bass today, how we can learn from some of the tips that Dan gives us. So why don't we talk about some of the new baits that you just released at the Bassmaster Classic? Sure. Um, I mean, the biggest one right now that we're super excited about, we put a lot of effort into is this, uh, is this juvie cross. So anyone who fishes a tube, this is really a, a modern take on this style of bait it's it's really a bait category that hasn't been all that exciting and oh gosh it's got to be you know 10 15 years you know we're all just dragging the same three two and a half inch baits to four up to four inches at times and tubes are, are absolutely incredible and um you know over the years i've always thought you know it'd be really cool to you know mit, like truly mimic some of the forage that these fish are eating and, and one of the favorite snacks for any kind of bass is a, is a small juvenile craw and for years, especially, you know, in tournaments and stuff, we're always struggling to, to match that hatch. We'll, we'll see them spitting out these little tiny crayfish. So 
Um, yeah, so this is our solution to that. A tube is a very versatile bait, and we essentially made it into a little a little juvenile craw. Um, it's super small. Uh, you know, on the screen, it it almost looks bigger than it is, but when you have it in your hands, you'll quickly realize that it's it does match the hatch on those little tiny craws, and, and it's a tube, so you can do a lot of really cool things with a tube, you know, whether it's adding scent, trailer hooks. We can even make this one weedless, which is really cool. That's something we designed in the design of it. We made it so that the, there's a bit more meat in the head of it, so you can actually make it weedless. In Ontario here, we've got a lot of milfoil and grass and stuff, and being able to pull that bait through the grass and not having it hung up definitely helps get more bites. So, yeah, so that's like... That bait has been an absolute, I mean, we knew when we developed it that it was going to be a really awesome bait, but anglers have just shocked and quite frankly shocked us at how much they want this bait. All the dealers and retailers are, are selling out of them. And I think it's just people understand it. They really, you know, they know what a tube is and they, and now they're seeing something that's a modern take and, you know, a company that's actually trying to do something creative with that bait category. So that's, that's our like, hero product i think that's going to be really hard to beat in the coming years in terms of acceptance and popularity but one that really flies under the radar is um is our small little uh, it's called the juicy helgramite helgramites are actually everywhere they're especially in the creeks but they're everywhere especially up here in the north and bass love them walleye love them everything panfish love them the helgramite has been a bait style that we've kept secret for a long time and won a lot of money in tournaments on and just hasn't been talked about. And we, we always keep an eye on this bait category, but you know, for us, there wasn't really a bait that we really truly love. There's just very limited selection. And for us, we wanted one that was just a little bit smaller, more finessey. And the biggest things with, with this bait is you can't really see it here, but there's actually a, a matte finish to it. So we eliminate the glare in all our baits. And that's a, a tournament secret. We used to rub all of our baits in the carpet of our boat before a tournament to knock the shine off that's in the manufacturing. So we figured out how to do that in our manufacturing. So if anyone sees our baits, they're actually getting a matte finish on everything. So that's like a tournament secret right out of the bag that people don't even realize. And then the other thing is um, we figured out how to make our baits sit perfectly level in the water. So if anyone goes to our, our website, you'll actually see this. But on a drop shot, these will sit perfectly level and they won't, they won't float and they won't sink. So you don't have to really do anything creative and you can just let that bait sit in front of those fish. So those are two big things that we wanted. Actually three things, size, a more natural looking profile, neutral buoyancy. So those are our two most exciting releases that we launched at the Bassmaster Classic. We hadn't released anything in over a year and a half. So for me, this is a really exciting time. We've been sitting on this stuff for a while. And um, so that's the soft bait side. The actually, I've got a few new colors in the um, in the snack craw. So this is our little. If anyone hasn't fished these before, these are our snack craws. This has become one of our most popular. It's like a Ned style bait. It's got floating claws, so it actually just the claws just lift a little bit when you drag it along the bottom. And people also use it as a, a jig trailer. So we came out with the green pumpkin purple, green pumpkin. It's called orange belly, but it's like more of a brown orange, very natural, trying to match our our craws up here, and then black blue, which is a a really popular craw color so those are the new colors and then and then some just terminal that they released i'm just going to go over this really high level but a, a new swim bait head with a forward eye placement so that the idea there is the eye will allow the bait to swim more horizontal in the water and also come through the grass without getting that those little pieces of grass stuck here so like we fish a lot of milfoil even for walleye and and bass and there's nothing more annoying than getting those, getting those little pieces of grass stuck here when you're ripping through the weeds so that eliminates that yeah really small hooks um if people go check this stuff out it's it's smaller stuff but it's sharp as heck and strong i, I was yeah. playing with some of those jigs and the hooks are brutally sharp yeah those are um they're gamagatsu hooks so they're you know in my opinion they're the best in the world yeah when i'm fishing tournaments i don't it's hard for me to get away from a gamagatsu so we incorporated Gamagots. I use a little lot products. of, I have a lot of confidence yeah. in them myself. And I, I guess one of the big questions I have is the salt that you use in these baits, is it good for human consumption? The salt itself? Uh, it, it tasted don't tell good them, when I looked it. at it earlier. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's it's salt, right? Like it's, I, I don't think you have to worry about getting it in your mouth. Um, yeah, no. The best thing is the bite test because these things are, are are tough too, which I love. Yeah, yeah. 
and they don't break in pieces. Like, yeah, we've got a really cool material. So it's not like traditional plastisol and it's not mm-hmm. that Elastec stuff. We put a lot of effort into to getting this material to do what we want. And we actually keep it a really well-guarded secret because every brand in the industry wants to know what we're using. But uh, so we keep that well-guarded, but it's really durable. And the biggest reason is for us, especially here in Ontario, like as you guys you know, may or may not know, but smallmouth are really dominating in the tournaments. You just It's just easier to catch in general, five big smallmouth over five big largemouth in a short time frame. So smallmouth by nature, they really group up. So generally, if you find one, there's probably more around. Sometimes the bite window can be really slow, like um, really short. And getting your bait right back in there is really important. So durability was a big thing for us. So even though they they've got great action, they're very durable. You can catch like 20 fish on on one bait. Super easy to rig. And sometimes for us, I mean, for the, you know, for someone who's not as like hardcore, you know, it might it may not make a big difference having to grab a new bait out of a pack. But for us, when we're we're in a tournament, that one bite could be the difference between winning and and maybe not even cashing a check. So all these small little details, you know, really Great Lakes Finesse is just a reflection of all the things that I would want as a term, top tournament angler in a bait. So we don't really uh, cut any corners because it all comes back to that is making baits that help us win. Yeah. And one thing that I'd have to say after, you know, we've, we bought a bunch of baits last year. They've been flying off the shelves. Sometimes they were hard to get. I remember I'd talk to the guys at Gagnons. They're like, yeah, we got the stuff in and I'd run in. I, I worked just down the road and I'd run in on my lunch break and grab a bunch because they'd be gone. Guys are slamming on these baits. They're absolutely insane. And the reason for that is, like you said, the attention to detail, like every little thing, you know, it's like matte finish, perfectly neutrally buoyant, the the angle of the eye where you attach it, like everything is premium. And although, you know, you fish tournaments, even guys like us, we may not be pros, but now we can buy professional baits that the pros use. And like you said, they're durable. So, you know, it may not be that we have to get in that bite window, but it's also the durability. It's a better value for us because those baits last longer in general. So for every angler, you buy a pack of these, they last a lot longer than some of the other baits that just tear up, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, for me, it's also a feel good thing. You know, we price our products in my opinion, really fair. We try to put as much, you know, as many baits as we can in a bag. It never comes down to how much money we're making. It's more about packing as much value as we possibly can. So into that bag and uh, at the price point, I think people will realize that not only are they, are they getting great value, they're also getting, you know, tournament tuned baits without even having to do anything. They just put them on their hook and they're they're fishing you know, top tier level performing baits that, you know, for us before we used to have to modify our baits and like I said, roll them in the, in the carpet of our boat or do weird things to make them do what these, these baits do right out of the package. Definitely. So kind of getting into the background, the first point I was going to say, like talk about the inception of the bait, you kind of already covered that it's getting these baits that you wanted to succeed in tournaments and being like, I need to do a bait that's like this and like this. But the next part point I was going to ask you is like, what differentiates your brand compared to other finesse brands on the market? Yeah, I think, I think uh, the term finesse is thrown around quite loosely in the industry. And, you know, I, I would say we are the only brand that's truly focused on the, the true finesse category. Um, a lot of brands will make a small version of a popular bait or whatever and call it finesse. For us, finesse is something that we've we've really developed and honed in on over the last 10 to 15 years. Your audience may or may not know, but just locally here in Southern Ontario, we've got three guys who are fishing on the Elite Series and another one who lives in Pickering, Evan Kung, who is leading the Opens and, and is I don't want to jinx anything, but if all, you know, if if things continue the way they are, you know, we're going to have four anglers locally fishing at the highest level. So, so what that means for us here locally is we got to compete against these guys. And to do that, we had to start really focusing in on, on finding an advantage. And for us, it was really light line and really small baits. So baits that, you know, people were using for panfish. We were like, hey, well, like we figured out that there was a way to truck trick these big pressured smallmouth into eating these little tiny baits that we were using for crappy and perch and stuff. Um, but the problem with those is that they would just when we first figured this out, they were all our baits were falling apart and our our hooks were cheap and you know we were losing a lot of fish. So it, for us, it we we wanted to set like when we were figuring all this out, we started making tackle for ourselves and keeping it a secret, pouring our own baits, making our own jig heads, like anything that would give us an advantage to compete at the highest level, which we are. 
just by nature of the anglers who are competing here against us. I ended up winning a lot of money and kept it a big secret. And then uh, about two and a half years ago, three years ago now, I had triplets. You know, for me, I always thought about making a making a, an attempt to, to compete down south and, and maybe try to be on the Elite Series. But when you have three kids at once, um, that dream, no, I wouldn't say it disappeared. It just, it, it didn't really make sense anymore. And, you know, I think the next best thing is kind of giving up some of these secrets and, and allowing people to experience the success we've had over the last, you know, 10 years winning, you know, a bunch of tournaments and whatever it may be. And just really exposing this true finesse style. And, and when I say finesse, I mean like, it's a system. It's not just one bait or two baits. It's like the right, it starts with the situation and then the rod you need, the line you need, the terminal tackle you need, and then the bait you need, and then presenting that bait in a finesse way. So what we do is we try to package not only these baits into a nice, you know, easy to understand system, but also empower anglers by giving them the information they need to have success with this style of fishing. And I think what's really cool about this finesse style is, you know, there's all this hype about big fish cat or big baits catch big fish. I truly believe that small baits catch like really small baits catch way more big fish. Not only will the, you know, our baits catch giant fish, but they're going to catch all of the fish. And we have baits that, I mean, when you fish our stuff, not only are you have an opportunity to catch a fish of a lifetime, but you're going to have one heck of a day because you're going to get a lot I, I of I think bites. that's one of the reasons why I really started fish finesse more and why I love it so much is yeah, like your time in the water is, especially for the average angler, you know, you're out there to, you know, to have a chance at, at we're always looking to catch our, our new personal best, but you're out there to have a good time on the weekend because you're getting out, you know, a handful of times a year only. And to be able to, to have something like this, where I like how you, how you put it, like you're, you built this from the ground up, uh, you know, designing these baits for the finesse presentation. Like they weren't designed for something else initially and then transferred over and they just tweaked a couple things like from the ground up you said hey i want to make a tube that is for a mimics crayfish exactly and you know is designed to be this size and i think that that really shows with with your stuff like i'm super pumped to to try some of these new things i have used some of their stuff in the past and and yeah like the quality is is absolutely fantastic but with with what you're saying there i was, I was just curious you're you're giving away kind of the trade secrets <laughs> which you know is is understandable like your your priorities shifted and that's that's awesome congratulations on the three three kids how did the anglers react to to you doing this like how how did either some of your fellow pros uh or the average angler how what's been uh, the response from from kind of both groups um I, I would say that you know for the the fellow pros i mean they're super appreciative to have access to this this type of product that was the first thing that we noticed when we launched the brand was the the caliber of angler was really high. And then even when we were working with some retailers locally, like Agnons and Peterborough Pro Tackle, for example, they were the first two stores to have our stuff. The feedback from them was it wasn't the masses that were coming and grabbing all the stuff. It was like a handful of guys clearing the shelf. And if they do have a problem with it, they're certainly not going <laughs> to tell me about it because they want to keep that a secret. So I haven't had any negative. I mean, the only negative feedback, and it was more jokingly, but kind of not was on this Helger might release a couple of the absolute local hammers. Was Cooper um, mad at you? I wouldn't say Cooper was, but someone who fishes with him was not <laughs> thrilled, was not thrilled and told me that Cooper would not be happy about it. But, and I think that's just because, you know, it's been such a well-guarded secret, but for us, it wasn't so much about continuing to have that as a secret it was about creating a Helger might that we felt would be better and would actually allow us to catch more fish. So I think, you know, like the pro angler level guys, what really separates them is not just the baits. It's, it's really everything, their decision making, time on the water, composure, all those things. The bait is just a small piece of the piece of the puzzle. So really the feedback has been overwhelmingly positive. And I think a lot of them are just so thrilled and they, we get messages almost every day saying, man, I broke my personal best on this bait or that bait. And for me, and I know this sounds crazy, but I've won a, several, like a lot of tournaments. If I never won another one again, and instead I got all of these messages about people having success on our products, that would make me way more happy. It was almost uncomfortable in the beginning for me to give up a lot of these secrets, especially in the baits and how we're fishing them. Like people probably still think like maybe we're faking it when it comes to our social media content, but it's not like we're literally giving up the juice. Like whatever you see there is real. And it's not like we're not staging anything. It's like if that fish was 
brought to the boat like that that bait caught it and that's how we caught it and, you know and I, we just love helping people and we've just actually found way more happiness in helping others um, rather than just keeping these secrets and holding them till we really die <laughs> well, we appreciate um, it <laughs> yeah yeah and and yeah what you said too like the pros it's, it's so much more than just just the baits like the baits give everyone an improvement an improved edge which is cool to be able to use something that you know has been a secret for so long or has you know been been closely guarded but i yeah, yeah for for anyone listening any let's say cooper gallant or or uh the johnson brothers or something if if we put them in my tinner and had to use my gear and my tackle box and they let me use their boat. This would never happen. But, you know, if they want to try, I'm cool with it. But, <laughs> and, and we just kind of switched all gear. They would still absolutely destroy us. Like, <laughs> it's, it's without any any issue whatsoever. So it's not. Uh, but, yeah, sharing sharing the techniques is another like big thing that I know I appreciate. And a lot of a lot of the guys do, too, because it's it's cool to, to not just see the results from from tournaments, but actually, like you say, get the juice, get the the actual instruction on how things work. That's, that's yeah. Cool. Yeah. I think like ultimately as well, um, you know, for me, giving up this stuff to help people catch more fish. I mean, ultimately, that's how we're going to grow the sport. And, you know, that that saying is thrown around loosely, but I think really if people spend some time and money and energy going out fishing and actually catch fish that's what grows the sport because they were going to want to go do that again and then bring their friends in. If, if they're going out fishing, I mean, it's hard to catch a fish on a big glide bait. Let's be real. But you know what I do, like if I take my wife out or, you know, someone who doesn't fish that much, like just give them one of these little sneaky underspin and I call it the, the lake vacuum. It's going to catch everything. You literally cast it out and reel it back in. And that's, what's going to get people excited and, and really uh, a lot of people uh, really enjoy their time on the water because like you said um, you might only get a handful of days a year to go and and why not help people you know have success out there definitely and we know if you've followed the brand any length of time like like i have that it is very very popular obviously like i said like sometimes you'd be you'd see it in store and you go back and it'd all be gone because guys are like cleaning up on this stuff so if you ever see this stuff buy it this is not a plug, just buy it because it's good stuff. But obviously you got super popular. Were you expecting to get to, you know, for it to shoot off that fast, that, that big? Absolutely not. Um, it was actually very much the opposite. Um, I had another job. Um, I was running another company. This was actually supposed to just be a side hustle. And, and really in my mind, the benefit was we were going to just have baits for ourselves and we were going to win. And if we sold some, that'd be great. We thought that it would be hard for people to understand and, and kind of figure out how to use this style of fishing. But we quickly realized there was a big appetite for this style of fishing and you know the super finesse stuff there's a big gap in the market and yeah it was like, certainly was not planned but we're gonna roll with it so after you got very big you had some news i think it was last year that you're now part of pradco yep so my question for you is how do you maintain the quality of your baits which we know is at a super high quality despite being part of a much larger family of companies? Yeah, I mean, that's a really great question. So I'll, I'll address like overall, Pradco approached us. They saw the, the popularity and they saw the empty pegs and they, they approached us. And for me, it wasn't so much a financial thing. It was really about seeing the brand reach its full potential. So there's a few things to that. So the first thing is we couldn't keep up to demand. It got to the point where we literally could not make this stuff fast enough and people were getting mad and the quality because we were starting to make it faster our quality was actually deteriorating a bit which you never want so when pradco approached us basically we talked to them for over six months and figured out a plan that would allow us to grow the brand but also increase the the you know the distribution the quality so to answer the question about the quality the quality is actually significantly better now under pradco because you know, they've got brands like Yum, Booyah, War Eagle. They're, I mean, there's stuff with Lindy. And so they, they're really experienced and have the capability to produce high volume of product, a high volume of product. So quality has actually gone up, I would say 20 to 30% just from moving over to their abilities and their, their factories. Everything about the product is actually 
the same. Like we haven't changed anything. The only thing that we changed was there was a few products we couldn't actually get Gamagatsu hooks, but when Pradco called Gamagatsu, that changes. So uh, we now have access. We now have access to literally the best of the best, and those vendors pick up the phone when when Pradco calls, which is great. You know, and the other thing too was uh, for me, it was about. You know, we knew we were making something. We had to cut off new dealers because we just couldn't make it fast enough. Even if we added more people, it just, I mean, I'll be honest, like even right now with Pradco Manufacturing, there's empty pegs everywhere. It's its absolutely crazy. We just launched that Juvie Crop. We made 45 times the amount we would have if we weren't under Pradco and it was sold out in a day and a half, like all of it gone. And we're running that stuff we were now Pradco is now running seven days a week and overtime shifts for anyone who wants to make baits in their factory. So it's just been absolutely crazy, but the quality has improved. We're able to supply, in, in my opinion, at a at a reasonable rate. That said, everyone's still got empty pegs here and there. And you know, a funny story. Speaking of Gagnons, uh, the owner called me, so he got the the Juvie Cross in. So he put them up one afternoon, like about three weeks ago and um they put them up online so that afternoon people were coming in when if they saw it they were grabbing them and then he got so the next morning he got to the shop and there was a lineup in the front of the store and they're all there for juvie cross well he sold out of them at night throughout the night so all those people came in they rushed to the glf section started grabbing packs of baits i guess like he opened up all the orders realized he was completely sold out and then was trying to like wheel the cart back and apparently a fight started. <laughs> and he said it was the first time he's ever seen grown men fight in his store over baits which is crazy because we're still a month like a couple months away from bass season um, it, it is Oshawa though. Yeah. So that's okay. <laughs> yeah. that's yeah. what yeah, what you yeah, didn't yeah. know is it was me and andrew fighting there <laughs> Oh, yeah. Justin's okay. like, get out. <laughs> yeah, He's like, Justin. not again. <laughs> that's just pretty funny. That was crazy. Yeah, that's funny. Yeah, anyway, so it's just been nuts. But yeah, so so for Pradco, and then also it's a knockoff industry, unfortunately. It's it's kind of the neat, the the ugly side of, of our fishing industry is, you know, a lot of times when things are hot and a small company can't make it fast enough, like we a situation we were in, a big company will – will basically make their own version and say they started it and did it and first to market and first to advertise. And so for us, we felt like the Pradco opportunity, would not only could we make the stuff and, and distribute it, it also, like we were the people that know this technique, we should be the ones bringing it to the market. And we just felt like overall, it would do the brand more justice and the style of fishing more justice if, if we were the ones running it. So so I work for Pradco now and, and I run everything to do with the brand to make sure that the quality is there and, and the identity is there and everything that makes the brand, in my opinion, great remains. That's good. Definitely. Oftentimes you see when sometimes companies uh, get absorbed by other ones, the quality is not the same or they lose kind of the creative control. So it's good to see that you're still uh, on top of that. So before we go any farther, I just want to push in right now. Speaking of the fact that Dan is still in control, he actually got control of a pretty sick giveaway that we're going to have. So I'm going to announce that right now. Dan was saying that you can't even get this stuff. This stuff is hard to get, but look what I got. I got a whole crate of it. Now, it is a mini crate, (laughs) but it is full (laughs) of Great Lake Finesse. There is actually nine or 10 packs of this stuff. So Dan has donated that to one lucky Patreon member, and we will do the draw for that. So there's tons of stuff in here. There's a whole bunch of snack craws, juvie craws. There's some of these drop worms, which are actually one of my favorite. That's a secret. Dan's like, ah, that's not a secret. They were good. (laughs) whole bunch of cool baits. So we'd like to thank you for that. It's awesome to get to get some cool giveaways, but it's even awesomer to get giveaways of stuff that you can't even get. That's super awesome. That's like exclusive giveaways. <laughs> so thanks for that, Dan. Oh, yeah, you're welcome. I'm pretty sure there was 15 packs. Uh, there was, but... <laughs> 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 Shh. <laughs> Andrew's like, what? <laughs> so we're going to have to go on to uh, more of the, the practical cool tips for average anglers here. Now I know Dan's got, you know, a sick bass boat and all the cool stuff and he's a pro and we're going to try to make it a little more relatable to the average Joe and Dan is good at teaching. So we're going to listen to some of his tips. So the first thing I thought we could just go through quick, this may sound like a very obvious question, but understanding finesse fishing. Now I know Andrew is a finesse guy. I'm the opposite. I like punching and 
chucking spinner baits and stuff like that. So I'm looking forward to learning more from not just Andrew, but Dan, of course. So understanding finesse fishing. So for our listeners who may be new to not fishing in general, but maybe finesse fishing, how would you define what it means and why it's so important for fishing in Ontario? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, in Ontario, our lakes, especially the Kawartha lakes and stuff, get a lot of pressure. So in my opinion, like finesse fishing is trying to present something very naturally, something that's not intimidating to a fish and something that's easy for them to eat. So, I mean, that's really, it's important because if you're always going for like a big bait or a big reaction strike, oftentimes, you know, whether it's weather or it could be pressure, it could be anything, those fish just might not react positively to that. Whereas I find a finesse presentation for the most part is pretty much effective any day of the year. And you can go out and catch fish anytime with light line and small little natural baits. I notice, like, especially saying again that I, I like power fishing, all that stuff. Andrew has handed my butt to me many days with his BFS combo. I remember that little, what's that little lure called? The, the Piku Piku. Yeah, it's like a wacky yeah. rigged hard <laughs> bait topwater. Oh, it's insane. Yep. He'll go out and catch like a five pound smallie in the Korthas on this tiny little bait on a little like light action bait casting rod. And I'm like, what the heck's going on? But it just shows the effectiveness on it. And it's true. Like we fish, generally we fish the Korthas and the pressure on there, especially in the summer, can be pretty intense. So any advantage that you can get by finesse fishing is definitely going to help you catch more fish. So for practical tips for anglers in Ontario, but also wherever they're listening, because people finesse fish all over the world, right? Which techniques should an angler that's just getting into finesse fishing definitely get down pat? Yeah. So the two that I would say are the biggest are drop shot, 100%. Drop shot is where you've got a weight below your hook and your bait is, is presented above the bottom and you can rig several baits on there, whether it's our drop minnow or our helgramite. Yeah, that thing is absolutely deadly on a drop shot. Um, <laughs> see Andrew there. And then the other one, the other one is, is dragging really small baits or just baits on the bottom. So like a Ned style presentation or honestly like a tube style bait like our juby craw is a the next generation in my opinion of a tube bait but i've won more money dragging a tube than anything else all over wherever i fish there's always a tube style bait tied on and and now it's just our juby craw so dragging whether it's a ned style bait like a our snack craw would fit in that category it's a small little bait you can drag on the bottom it's designed for that and then the drop shot baits i would say those are the the first two that you should probably learn you know we can talk about the cindy rig and stuff which is more of a horizontal presentation where you're casting and retrieving and then i i would say if there was a really easy one it's really this sneaky underspin this is one that I was talking about earlier and I, these are kind of the two colors that I always throw. If I was to only, if you were to say, Hey, you can only fish one bait for the rest of your life, no matter where you go. And you have no idea what's in that lake. This is what I'm throwing. Like I call it the lake vacuum anywhere I go. If I, I'll, I'll use an example. I've got a cottage in Quebec. I was checking out some back lakes. I had no idea what was in that lake. So I threw, I, this is what I throw. I throw a little sneaky underspin within three casts. I had two brook trout. That's just everything eats it. All you do is cast it out and reel it straight back. That's it. It's so easy. It's just our sneaky underspin paired with our little drop minnow. And you can also throw a little swim bait on the back. But I, I think our little drop minnow is super finesse. And it'll get you bites, especially walleye. If you're a walleye angler, this is something like this is like my number one walleye bait anywhere I go. Just cast it along a weed line or up shallow along some sand or wherever that you think they're hanging out. This sneaky underspin is absolutely deadly and it's very hard to throw it for a day and not catch a pile of fish. Yeah. We actually picked up a bunch yeah. last year when we could find some. I remember seeing them at Ganyans too, and I, I ran in and grabbed a whole bunch because I was looking for a specific yeah. color and they absolutely slaughter fish. Like they're they're really mm -hmm. good and the hook is super sharp. It's one of those baits I just have confidence. I know when I throw it, you just like you're just waiting for a bite. You know it's gonna happen. It's not like Oh, I wonder if this bait works. You look at it, you're like, even if you've never used it before, you're like, oh, that's fishy. You know, just an absolute beast of a lure. So, yeah. So, yeah. There's tons of different finesse techniques, and like you said, fishing in general, it's it's adapting to this finesse approach. And you see, if you follow, you know, the Bassmaster or like any of the professional tournaments, you're seeing all these new rigs coming out. People fishing different ways, like you know, like hover strolling and all this all this different stuff that's coming out. But when it comes down to it, the one thing I do like about your brand is it's all the stuff you make, it's just super natural looking. It's not 
stuff that's too crazy. Like you see all these like, you know, G crack balls with all the fur coming out. Like, oh, that's cool. But it doesn't look like anything. I'm sure it catches fish. But all this stuff, it just looks like timeless. Like you could still be throwing this in 40 years and it would still work great. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a really good point. Um, you know, something that we we committed to when we started the company was, was oftentimes the, the flashiest bait isn't the one that gets the most bites. Um, we've definitely found that like the stuff that looks kind of dulled down and maybe not the most attractive when people you walk into a store it's probably not the one that's going to catch your eyes but we're co- we were always committed to let's make baits that catch fish let's not worry about catching anglers a lot of brands i've worked in this industry for a long time i worked for a major one the focus is oftentimes how do we get the customer to pick our bait off the shelf in the sea of baits we never do that we've never attempted to do that our goal was we were going to let the success on the water be what drives the demand. And we felt like there's nothing more powerful than word of mouth. And once a handful of people start fishing this stuff, it's not going to take too long for people to realize that this stuff absolutely crushes fish. And and that's really what's driven the demand. I mean, even you were talking about that, that company, Pradco, buying us. We hadn't spent a dollar in marketing up to that point. It was all driven through just some social media posts and, and word of mouth and all positive stuff that was being said about the stuff definitely yeah i was gonna say uh, going into a a different topic i i know you fish like a lot on the saint lawrence as we were mentioning before areas that don't have a lot of weeds Um, and some of the lures that you're talking about like dragging stuff on the bottom doing stuff like that where i fish a lot of times that isn't possible because there's a lot of weeds (laughs) so my question for you and i'm hoping a lot of the listeners maybe fish lakes that are also fairly infested with with grass and weeds uh, if you were fishing a lake like that, what which ones of your baits would be something that you would throw? Okay, so the first little tidbit of info I'm going to give everyone is all of those lakes that you're describing, they've got hard bottom somewhere. So rocks or sand or whatever. And generally, if the we if the if you feel the lake is very weedy, fish will generally gravitate to. It almost seems like whatever there is the least of. So if there's only a handful of rock piles or whatever, you'll find that a lot of the fish go to those areas. So that's where you want to be focused on. Whereas if you're on a lake that's extremely rocky and almost seems like there's no weeds anywhere, there's weeds somewhere. And if you find them, that's where the fish are going to be. So something that people don't really know, 90% 90% of the fish in any given body of water in, are in 10% of the lake. And generally it's it's on a hard bottom area on a weedy lake so finding some weeds with hard bottoms so that's a secret that maybe not everyone wants everyone to know but if you are out there try to find those areas whether it's thinking about looking along the shoreline or whatever and, and thinking about what it looks like underwater coming off of that shoreline and try to find some sand or rock when it comes to the baits that will play i would say the vast majority are designed for more open water not into the thick weeds it's, it's just not really where these baits are designed to play, um, but if you if you can find pockets, you can throw you know our underspin along a weed line. Um, it's really hard to get a sneaky underspin past a weed line and uh, not get bites. So even um, being able to rig those those tubes yeah, you're but, saying have a bit more like thickness in the top. It's not a uniform thickness on the the shell of the tube. So to be able to rig that weed list, yeah, you could be flipping that into pockets and stuff like that. Because I know normally Texas ringing a tube can be a bit of a challenge. You got to get your separate like internal weights and stuff like that. Like it's it can be a bit of a pain, but to be able to just Texas rig the tube because it's designed to be Texas rigged, like that's that's going to be killer. Yeah, or for fishing those weedy areas. Yeah, you, you you could you could definitely Texas rig it, it like any other tube. Um, you just need smaller hooks and stuff. I do want to touch on that a little bit. What's really cool about this tube, people might not realize, is there's a lot of engineering that went into this bait. So on the back end of the bait, it's actually thicker on the inside. So that's so your tube hook doesn't blow out. But then in the middle, it's actually thinner. So on the bottom especially, and that's so that when a fish bites down on it, so this is like, this is one that's that's rigged. When a fish bites down on that, it collapses as much as it possibly can to open that up. So like some of the engineering that went into that, and then it's got floating claws and stuff. But yeah, so you could you could definitely, called texposing it, you basically just run the hook into the head hmm. like that and there's enough meat there to hold and then you could you could probably throw that around docks or you know pockets that you find on a weedy lake um, that was the intention of it but really you know when we're thinking about smallmouth especially we're, we're always looking for that hard bottom and that's where these baits really shine is rock piles sand shell beds which are 
very prevalent in Lakorthas. <laughs> we have this one lake that me and Andrew fish. It's it's a Kortha lake. We've talked about it before. And it's super weedy, like weeds the whole lake. We found one day just drifting over this huge rock pile that's probably the size of like eight cars. Yeah, it's not that big. And we we pinned it on our GPS. We're like, oh, it's six by. Every time we go there, every time we clean up. Every single time we catch three or four good and good bass, usually three or four of them at least. So we always rush there. It's the first spot we hit when we hit that lake. It's just like all slop and lily pads, and all sent out of nowhere. There's this big rock pile, and that's where the fish are. So that that's definitely a good tip, and it may take you some time. No one's going to tell you these spots. Don't ask. We're not going to tell you, but it may take time to to actually go around and find these these hard bottom spots. Because we know a lot of times smallmouth and, and largemouth, they relate to something that's different around them. So that is, that's a great tip. It's a good tip for me to remember every time I'm flipping and not catching anything, I should be finding some, some hard rocks, right? <laughs> I, I like that too, is like finding the thing that is the least common. Because yeah, like I'm thinking that this is another lake we fish. There's a lot of timber, but like it's kind of real hit and miss in the timber, but there's tons of timber. But yeah, if you can find something that's, that's different that's you know maybe they're not holding to that because yeah they're they're the fish are looking for structure to have that difference they want something to relate to if the whole lake is all the same thing there's nothing to relate to so looking for either the lack of structure becomes the structure yeah so in general what are some of your favorite uh combinations of your of your baits that you have because i know like just the baits that i i picked up last year i had one of my favorites was the drop worm I was rigging that, Mm -hmm. uh, I kind of, I do finesse sometimes, but I have more of like a slight power shot, almost slightly heavier line, like maybe eight pounds instead of like, you know, six or whatever. I used that really like that. Uh, we had a bunch of the, the sneaky underspins last year, which were fantastic, but we're really excited to try some of the new ones, but what are some of your absolute favorite? I know you kind of touched on them, but your favorite combinations uh, of your baits and your jigs. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like I said, the, um, the sneaky underspin anywhere I go, I mean, I'm always going to have this tied on any time of the year. There's, there's certain days where it shines more than others. The second one would be the snack craw on our stealth ball head. So it's on a ball head specifically so that it can get around grass. The ball head actually performs better around rock when there's a little bit of grass around. So that's why we prefer the ball head and all these baits have a powder coat and they're baked so they don't chip, but we also protect the eye. So you don't have to break the the paint when you're tying a like, line on these or anything. But we've caught more bass over six and seven pounds on this little tiny bait than anything else that we that we've got in our lineup. And then the other one would be our, our drop minnow, which is our it's two point seven five inches. This is actually the bait that we used to break that record. For the most part, we, we mixed in the snack raw, but this was the bait that we use and it's got that true neutral buoyancy. And on a drop shot, it's it's just so small and natural looking that everything eats it. Those would be like our my our top three. One that doesn't get a whole lot of mention and, and flies under the radar is this little flat cat. And we'll we'll drop shot this guy and we'll also put on a ball head. And and I've got some guys who are just like, that's the best bait they've ever used in the world. We love it. We catch a lot of fish on it. I will say though, right now, this juicy Helgramite is probably it's gonna fly under the radar, but it could quite possibly be our best fish catcher for everything like you're just gonna get a lot of bites a lot of walleye i mean we fished this bait like crazy last year to test it i mean we we went through 10 different versions of it to finally dial this thing in but this is quickly becoming probably my favorite in the in the bottom bait category just because tubes are just always going to to catch fish and this one this one's just so much more natural and and just head to head with the tube something that we tested last year because we were not interested in just making baits for the sake of making baits uh, when we we tested it right beside the same color of tube, like this is an example of a tube we would throw with the same jig head that we use. So that it's, it uses our same mini pro tube head side by side, fishing the same hump, same points, wherever you're fishing. The juvie crowd definitely gets more bites. So I think that one's going to quickly become my, I mean, that's a loaded question, right? Like everything that we make literally is is stuff that we would have tied on in the biggest tournament of our lives. And they're all situational. So it really depends on the situation and, and what we're trying to accomplish. And that's really how all the baits start is we've got a problem. We, we don't know, we need a bait to, for that situation or that, you know, that specific fish that we're after. And, and then we come up with an idea, like we write down all the things the bait needs to do. And then we start designing the actual bait. Definitely. Yeah. I was going to say that mm-hmm. is kind of a trick question because it's all good stuff. <laughs> 
it's like trying to choose yeah. your favorite kid of the three you're like well <laughs> they're yeah, all good <laughs> except for yeah, that one. De- de- depends on the day i'll be honest um we my wife and i have this r- running joke we're like who's your favorite today because we they're all our favorites every day there's one favorite <laughs> So I think the final question before we get to, to wrap it up is, do you have any advice or words of wisdoms for our listeners who are eager to improve their finesse fishing skills? Yeah, I, I think um, there's a lot of information online about all these finesse styles of fishing. So the internet is your your best friend when it comes to learning about drop shotting or net rigging. You can learn so much and then just committing to it. I mean, the nice thing about the finesse stuff is that it really doesn't take you that long to get confidence in something. So like something like flipping a jig, for example, I found like I've got a lot of confidence in a jig, a flipping jig, but it took me a a while to really get confidence with that style of bait, you know, a big giant glide bait or something like that's something that just requires a lot of time to get confidence in, but finesse fishing really just pick the style you want to do, whether it's drop shot, Ned, the underspin commit to it for, you know, a certain amount of time and, and keep working at it. It really won't take you long to gain a lot of confidence. And the only thing that I would say is be careful not to stop once you've discovered the power of one of the finesse styles. Like once you discover how effective drop shotting is, you might get caught in this trap where all you want to do every day is just drop shot. And that's something that I see people, they've got this one favorite style of finesse fishing and that's all they'll do. And they don't really expand beyond that. So it's hard to really get into all of it, but in a short amount of time here that we're talking, but yeah, just, just sticking with it and picking a style and, and commit to it. Definitely. Yeah. So we'd like to thank Dan again for being on the podcast. Actually, he was like, Oh, thanks for having me on the podcast. And I'm like, are you serious? Thanks for coming on our podcast. This is crazy. <laughs> I told yeah. you guys good things in the work for 2024. So this is one of them, but we'd like to thank you again too, for providing this awesome giveaway. Like you said, there there wasn't actually 15 packs, I wish, but there's a <laughs> lot of stuff here. This is, if I won this, I'd be very happy. There's nine or 10 packs of stuff. It's like a hundred dollar value. So we thank you again for that. And again, if you're listening to this and you're wondering how you can enter into all these awesome giveaways that we have multiple times a month, you have to be a Patreon member to be entered automatically into every week's draw. So again, we'd like to thank everyone for writing reviews. I would actually just like to read very quickly. I thought I'd read one of them because every so often when we check our uh, our analytics for the podcast, all these new reviews pop up. And I'd like to read this one because this one was especially awesome. So this guy named J-Hop, it's a cool name. It's like I-Hop, but one better. Yeah. So he says, rename the show to Awesome Ontario Anglers. (laughs) Still AOA, so it's okay. He says, the title says it all. As an avid angler for years, I have listened to many different fishing pods, most of which suffer from inconsistent publishing, poor audio, bloated content and advertising, and empty banter. Not these guys. Every episode is well thought out, moves at pace, and has great audio, provides applicable fishing guidance to anglers of all skill levels, and most of all, it's fun. The hosts are funny and knowledgeable while remaining humble and relatable. Listening to them feels like you're having a beer with friends you've known for years after a long day out on the water, but without the swearing. (laughs) Their advice has definitely put more fish in the boat while passing many miles on my commute. Subscribe to these guys. You'll be glad you did 100%. (laughs) So we'd like to thank J-Hop for that. And again, please write us a review. It helps us do better in the podcast charts, which helps us get awesome sponsors like Great Lake Finesse for our giveaways, which is totally awesome. So... Before we finish this podcast, we have a tradition that we make all the guests do. We have on the spot, the quote of the week. And to handle that is going to be Dan. Yeah. So I thought about this and and one that I learned really early on is never leave fish for fish, whether it's whether you're on the water or you're in a tournament or whatever, you know, even if the bite slows and you know, there's fish around, I've been, I've been burned way too many times thinking grass is greener somewhere else. And then, you know, live to regret leaving that pot of fish that I was on. So that's kind of something that I live by now is, is if you're on fish, spend the time figuring them out. Yeah, never leave fish for fish. <laughs> <laughs>